Father, we are grateful to be in this place today. And it is good to have the fellowship of one another and just the, the joy and the, the, the sounds of people visiting and enjoying one another. And so, Lord, we're glad uh, to be a part of all of that today. And we're glad to, to be here to worship and, and honor you in our celebration. And Father, as we come this morning, uh, we just each week want to faithfully remember our village missionaries who are serving around the United States and Canada. We remember Ernie and Connie Lambright today in Sheridan Lake Bible Church in Colorado. And we pray they have several ministries there. They're on a route for the bicyclists going across the country. And so they have a ministry to those bicyclists as they travel. And I know we've had a little part of that ourselves as some, of, some have come through our area and stayed with us. And so we just pray that would be a fruitful ministry. Uh, wisdom for them in church ministry decisions as they move out of COVID restrictions. And I think we could say, uh, Lord, help us with that as well in our place. They're praying for Awana and Summer VBS and their men's and ladies retreats and all of these things that are happening in their church. Spiritual renewal for individual lives and times of refreshing in God's word. And they're asking for health and strength for the folks in their church family as well. So, Lord, Many things to pray for in each one of these churches, but specifically today, we do lift up the, the Lambrights and Sheridan Lake Bible Church. May you bless them and their ministry, Father. May it be fruitful. May many come to know you through the outreach of that particular fellowship, Lord, we pray. And Father, now as we gather here at Camp Creek Church, we are excited to be able to worship you today and to celebrate the, the amazing uh, events of Pentecost Sunday so long ago. So, Lord, as we worship you this morning, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. May you touch our hearts, Lord, through the times of singing, through our times of prayer, through our time in your word, and our times of fellowship as well. May you draw us very close to you today. We love you, and we give you praise. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. This morning, as we come to Pentecost Sunday, our, our focus today, if you will, our worship focus is on experiencing the mighty power of God. The power of God was poured out in an amazing way on Pentecost Sunday. And it was uh, that resurrection power that brought Jesus from the grave that then filled that place and caused God to work, caused God to work in an amazing way through his Holy Spirit. So if you'll stand with me this morning, we celebrate that power. We come today as his people, where the church was born on that Pentecost day, we are grateful to be a part of his church today and celebrate that this morning. Let every 
wonderful to be together. We come today different stages and different different places in our life, different struggles, different things, just as that song said. But when we do come together, we can be reunited in our praise, raising hallelujahs together. Hallelujah just means praise God. So let's do that together. Let's raise our hallelujahs together.
be to God. We invite you to be seated as we continue in worship. It's wonderful. We get to hear Laura once again as she reads scripture. Thank you, Laura. We're so happy to have you back. So oh, nice to be back and worship in person again and, and be able to read and share scripture with you this morning. Um, as with uh, today is Pentecost, and so it is in our scripture reading this morning, Pentecost is 50th, Greek for 50th. It is the 50th day since Passover or the 50th day since first fruit. And so to celebrate this celebration, Jews of many nations were gathered in Jerusalem. When the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles in flaming tongues of fire, they began speaking in the tongues of all of these nations. And there was much confusion among the Jews there. And so some of them even said perhaps the disciples were drunk. So Peter addresses the crowd. Our reading is Acts 2, verses 14 through 41. Listen for the word of the Lord. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days... God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show you wonders in the heavens above and signs on earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles wonders and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and you, with the help of wicked men, you put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of, dead, of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, 
they were out of the, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thank you, Laura. That was just to bring that to life yet again, to hear that passage, to imagine being there that day to see God's Spirit poured out. And He's still pouring out His Spirit. He's not done. This next song that we're going to sing, we're going to make that our prayer. We're still calling on the Spirit of God to breathe on His church, which He started that day. Let's make this our prayer. Join us when you can. Spirit of God, Breathe on your church, pour out your presence, speak through your word. We pray in every nation, Christ be known.
Father, we, we celebrate that this morning. We celebrate the salvation that you have brought into our lives through Jesus Christ. Father, we are so grateful for mercy. We are so grateful for grace, forgiveness, and your love. And Lord, we realize as sinners, ones who, who have done so, so much wrong, and are unable to save ourselves, that we need you to bring us into your kingdom, Father. And we thank you that Jesus went to the cross and died in our place to give us life and to open the door to heaven to us. And so today we're mindful of that, Lord. We're mindful of the power that was poured out on that Pentecost Sunday so long ago. And to hear that, that message that Peter preached to the crowd that ended in and over 3,000 people coming to know you. What an amazing day that must have been. And Father, we're grateful today that you are still at work. And Lord, we rejoice in your work. And right now, we just think about your work in us. And the work that you want to do in us today. And so, Lord, we, we come with hearts that are, are willing to confess to you today those things that are not right in our lives, Lord, whether they're thoughts that we think or things that we do or words that we say, actions that don't measure up to what you would have us live, Lord, whatever it may be, we just take a moment to lay those before you, to confess those things, and Lord, to seek your forgiveness. We are mindful of your word that tells us if we will confess our sins, you are faithful and just, and you will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we come for that cleansing today. So, Lord, we just take a moment now, quietly before you. Hear our prayers, Lord, of confession. Hear our, hear our prayers of grace and love and mercy. May we just draw close to you in these moments.
for that is our prayer this morning, that your Holy Spirit would fall fresh upon us today. Lord, fall fresh upon us as we've been worshiping you and in song and your word. And Lord, now as we open your word to study and learn a little bit more about that event of, of Pentecost, Lord, we ask your spirit to fall upon us and enlighten us to what your word is teaching us. And Lord, help us to grab even just one truth that, Lord, we can take away into the week and live for your glory. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be here in your presence today. Thank you for your Holy Spirit fall afresh upon us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, so good to be with you all today. And we do have junior church, but I don't know if there's any junior churchers here today. There aren't. We just continue to help me in spreading the word that we're having that. You know, we didn't for so long that it's hard to um, sometimes get things back going again. So we are certainly having that time for our younger kids and so forth to have. But today, uh, none of them are here to do that. So anyway, I want to thank uh, uh, Monica and Diane who are, who are ready to go if uh, needed with the kids. So we have something in the wings. But anyway, it's good to have each one of you here today. And what a beautiful day the Lord has given us to come and worship him together. What a beautiful, uh, beautiful morning the Lord has given. And again, welcome. Thank you for being here today. You know, power is important in life in a number of different ways. Uh, we need power to energize our homes, and we all know what that's like when the power goes off, and of course, you know, everybody's talking generators now, including the church, you know, a big generator setting out over here with that idea of when the power goes off, hopefully we can hook something up so that we can have some of those things that we enjoy when the power fails. We also need power to drive our cars, don't we? Um, and we need power to accomplish all those things in daily life. Now, isn't that something you do daily? No? No? Some of you? <laughs> well, power is important. But, you know, even more important than these types of power that we've been looking at is the power that God has given us in the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. That is amazing power. And we've been talking about that, in a sense, over the last several weeks. And we're bringing our sermon series, which we've called Life After Easter. That series comes to a close this morning uh, with Pentecost Sunday. And we're going to see a wonderful demonstration of God's power, wonderful demonstration of his power on the day of Pentecost. And I, I love Laura sharing the scripture today, and that's going to be important as we look more at this, the piece that she read. And she shared with us that idea that the term Pentecost does come from the Greek word, and it means 50th, and it's referring to that uh, Feast of Weeks, uh, the 50th day after Passover and the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of 50 Days, as it's called in rabbinic tradition. And the title of the, the final message in our series today is Resurrection Power at Its Finest. Because really, we see the power of God, the resurrection power of God at its finest at this moment uh, on Pentecost. Our text today is Acts chapter 2. So if you'll join me there in your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 2, and pull out your bulletin if you're going to jot down uh, some notes today on what we're talking about. But our text again is in, in the book of Acts chapter 2, and Acts comes right uh, after the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then we find the book of Acts, and we're looking at Acts chapter 2. We're looking at the entire chapter uh, today, somewhat verse by verse, except for Peter's sermon. That piece we're going to look at a little bit differently. But Acts chapter 2, and we're going to observe this morning three displays of resurrection power, three ways that God displayed his power on that Pentecost Sunday. And here's the first one, if you're taking notes and want to jot this down, is power in the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing that we see in this account or this event in Acts chapter 2. 
Uh, the passage specifically is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Acts chapter 2 and verses 1 through 13. And I want to read uh, this section to you this morning. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and, and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they had heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pergia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. So we want to pause there and look at this. Uh, I want to do some observations. So as I read these sections of Scripture, and a good point of, of Bible study methods is, is to observe what is taking place and even write down some of those observations of what we see happening in the text. So here are some observations about, first of all, what the disciples experienced as they gathered together, it says, in one place. And we, this is specifically from verses 1 through 4. Here's some things that I observe as I look at this passage. First of all, they heard a sound like a violent blowing wind. So they're hearing something happen. It's interesting that the wind is often talking about breath. And, and oftentimes the Spirit of God is referred to as the breath of God. And so here we have a powerful breath of God pouring out upon all these ones who are gathered uh, that day. So they heard something. They also saw something. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. What an interesting picture, you know, flames. Anymore, I think all of us that have experienced some sort of evacuation and dealing with fire, tongues of fire we really don't want to see anymore. You know what I mean? I, I don't even, I, we were driving, of course, we went over to Sisters this weekend, so we drove through all of, you know, the devastation that they are working on recovering again, and there's a fire right there by the road. They're just burning rubble and, and debris, and I don't even like to see that. I mean, it's like, you know, because there's a bit of a fear of that flame. This flame that came upon them as tongues of fire was not destructive in any way, shape, or form, but they saw, it says, what seemed to be tongues of fire. It looked like fire that was coming out. So there's this wind and there's fire. Many times the fire represents the presence of God. Isn't that interesting? So we have the of God and the breath, and we have the presence of God. And then it says, another observation is that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. At that point, they were just filled with the Spirit of God, totally and completely. Every ounce of them was filled with His Spirit. And then it says that they spoke in, in other tongues or other languages. So that, that's what took place uh, upon these disciples that were gathered there, as verses 1 through 4 tells us. Now, let's do some more ob observations, make some more observations on what the crowd, the crowd, which it says was made up of God-fearing Jews from every nation who had gathered for this Feast of Weeks. So they're all gathered for this feast. They're all there gathered. So what a prime time for all of this to happen. And what did they witness, and how did they respond? And so I want to make some more observations from verses 5 through 13. You can jot these down if you want, but first of all, they heard their own language being spoken. They heard their own language being spoken. These were actual known languages of the day. 
So these guys, as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other languages that they did not know, but that were recognized out there in, in the crowd. They were, they, were, they were hearing their own languages being spoken. And you know, I don't know if you've been in many international scenes. I have not, but the limited time that I've been anywhere where there's other languages spoken, when I hear English being spoken, it just sparks my attention. Because it's like, oh, there, I can understand that. <laughs> you know, I, I can't understand this, and I, I can't understand this, but oh, someone's speaking what I understand. I think in the same way, all of a sudden, as they heard God's word being proclaimed in their language, they were drawn to that. They heard their own language being spoken. Also, they were amazed that the Galileans were speaking all these languages. They're like, why do they know all of these languages? They shouldn't know them. They should be speaking, you know, their Galilean dialect. Why are they speaking my language? How can they do that? And then they asked, the crowd asked, what does this mean? They were curious about all that was happening. It's like when we're in a situation that we don't understand, we're probably asking, what does this mean? I don't get what's happening here. You know, what does this mean? They were curious about it. And then there's always the ones that, you know, if they don't get it, they're just going to, you know, try to put a damper on it. And there was a group there that says that they mocked the disciples for, for being drunk. It was the only explanation that they could come up with. Now, I don't quite understand why you would think if someone could speak another language, why they'd be drunk. But anyway, that's kind of what they came up with. That, you know, the only reason they can do, they must be drunk, you know. So that was what they said. Now, as you can imagine... Pentecost was an amazing event. That, that day when the Spirit was poured out, it was very miraculous in nature. I mean, even just the description of it. Uh, you know, that wind that was blowing and the tongues of fire that they were seeing and then all of a sudden being able to speak in other languages and seeing the re crowd react to that. It was filled with much excitement, much enthusiasm, and I'm sure a bit of fear and trembling. You know, not quite sure what all was happening. And as a whole, the crowd didn't fully understand all that was happening as God poured out the power of his spirit. However, Peter was now going to clear a few things up, and God's power would continue to flow through Peter. And that brings us to our, our second point. We see God's power poured out uh, through his Holy Spirit. We also see the power of God in the proclamation of the word of God. Word of God. And I love it here that it was Peter who Jesus restored so marvelously when he led out of this Remember that a few weeks ago we talked about that. How Peter was reinstated. And and how, you know, because of his, you know, his desire to follow the Lord so strongly, he said, I will never deny you, Lord. And then of course he did. And then Jesus restored him. And this was part of the reason why Jesus restored him. This was part of the reason why Jesus restored him in front of the other disciples. He wanted them to see that Peter is now going to be a leader, and he's going to lead out in, in the ministry that I have at hand, and we see that perfectly here. Now, the verses, verses 14, Acts 2, 14 through 41, these are the verses Laura shared with us, and Laura, thank you so much, and it was wonderful to, to have you back and reading again. I love that. So I appreciate you sharing those words today from God's Word. Uh, so I'm not going to read them all again, and I hope you followed them along as she shared them, but I want to highlight a few things about this powerful proclamation of the Bible that stood out to me. First of all, God's Word here explained this Holy Spirit event. Notice in verses 14 through 21, first of all, Peter says these folks aren't drunk. I mean, he wanted to clear that up right off the bat, and I love how he said it's only nine in the morning, you know? You see a little humor in that. But anyway, he says that's not it. It's not because of they're being controlled by wine, okay? They're being controlled by something else. They're being controlled by the Spirit of God. And so he starts going back into the Old Testament. As these Jewish folks are gathered here, they know the Old Testament. They know Joel. So he says, the prophet Joel tells us this in verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. So this here that we see at Acts chapter 2 is a partial fulfillment of what Joel predicted. 
Now, as you read through and follow through what Laura was sharing with us about this prophecy, we see that there are several things that are not quite fulfilled yet in that prophecy of Joel. It goes toward the last days. But this particular part of that prophecy, that the Spirit of God is going to be poured out, is definitely fulfilled there. So God's Word was explaining this, and, and uh, Peter took the time to share God's Word here. Secondly, in this section right here, God's Word told the story of Jesus. So after Peter puts some background to it and says, look at our prophet, our prophet Joel, tells us that this event was going to happen. The Spirit of God would be poured out. And now he's talking about Jesus in verses 22 through 36. He says here in verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death. He went on to proclaim the gospel and to proclaim what Jesus Christ had done for them. And so he shares the whole story of Jesus here. He talks about David even and how David would attest to the resurrection of Jesus and how important that was. So clear through verse 36, we have God's word telling the story of Jesus. And then as we wrap up this particular section that Laura shared with us, verses 37 through 41, God's word brought an amazing response. Isn't that incredible? The response that that came forward um, after it was shared, I'm looking at verse 37, yeah, when the people heard this, it says they were cut to the heart. I'll look at a verse a little later that talks about how God's word cuts us to the heart. So it says they were cut to the heart by the word of God, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? (laughs) And Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He told them what to do, said you need to confess your sins, and you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. You need to turn your life over to him. You need to follow him in baptism. You know, this is what you need to do to be saved. God's word brought on this amazing response, and and I love that. God's word continues to do that today. And, you know, God's word today is still active as it was when Peter preached it. And I I just love this particular verse. It's in Hebrews 4.12. Maybe some of you have memorized it over the years or you're familiar with it. It says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's why I love it there. After Peter was preaching God's word and sharing God's word to the people, it says the people were what? Cut to the heart. God's word did that. Cut them to the heart. I really think it's important when we share the gospel with people, even though we we know what different verses say and maybe we can quote those verses, I find power and I found power in sharing it with, with other people when I open God's word. And why even have them read, maybe, a verse. So instead of quoting, let's say, even John 3, 16, we all pretty much know that and can probably can quote that. So when I'm sharing Jesus with someone, instead of saying, well, you know, God's word tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I have them read that and say, isn't that amazing how God loves you and God loves me? Let his word cut to the heart of individuals. Let his word speak. Tracts are wonderful. Gospel tracts are great that you can share, but we need to get back to say that this is coming from the word of God. It's the word of God that changes the hearts. And so I just encourage that because that's what we see in this passage. As Peter preached his word, they were cut to the heart and they responded to him. So there is great power in the Bible. That's why it's so important to read it study it, and meditate on it. It has the power that we need for life and godliness. So not only was the power poured out through the Holy Spirit, the power poured out through the proclamation of God's word. Here's the third and last one for today. I believe that there was power in the prayer and the praise 
of the church, power in the prayer and praise of the church. And this power is shown in the initial stages of this fellowship of the believers, the church, as they praised the Lord and as they prayed together. And so I want to call your attention to the latter part of chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Will you look at that with me? It says, they devoted themselves, so just a minute, from 41, it says, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Talk about church growth, you know, what are you going to do with that? Um, so these ones were being added to, to the, the, that number. And so at that point, this, this church was formed. And so these people who uh, accepted the Lord, they are the they in verse 42. They, these ones who are now Christians, followers of Jesus, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Again, I want to make some observations about this early church as we have it recorded for us here in these verses. The first thing I see is that this church was devoted to basically four things. The teaching of God's Word. That's the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to that. They uh, fellowshiped with one another. They got together with one another for fellowship. They had communion. That was part of the breaking of the bread. It was interesting there in that early church scene, uh, early Christians, they got together to, to eat together a lot, and part of that was followed up with communion. You know, practically at every meal, as they are together, they would have a communion time. So that was part of it. And then prayer is the last thing we see. And some consider these to be the four basic elements of the church. Teaching, fellowship, communion, and prayer. Things that the church should continue to be doing today. But that's what they were doing as the early church. And then one, I, I noticed that as, as I'm reading it, I, didn't, I skipped over verse 43 when I jotted my notes down. So here's one that's not on the screen for you. But it talked about how uh, everyone around them was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. At that point, the apostles were performing some amazing miracles. And it was attracting a lot of tension in that early church. And people were drawn to see what's going on here. There's some power happening that we're not used to in these wonders and signs. So that is a piece of that early church. And then the next one that I wrote down for you is that the church was together and it shared with one another and helped one another. And that's just an amazing picture. And, and I just, not to get um, you know, political at all, but I don't believe that this is a call to socialism or some sort of government-mandated re redistribution of wealth at all. What it is, it is a call from God for the brothers and sisters to help and serve one another. And what power is in that as God's people are serving one another? Not because they're told to, you know, not because it's a mandated thing, because we love one another and we care for one another. And you have a need and I have a way to help you with that need. And so I'm going to do that. And I do think that is how the church should function. And I have seen that in our own fellowship at Camp Creek Church, functioning that way many times, as there a need comes up. And then we let that need be known, and it gets met. And I praise God for that. And I think that's a very important piece. But the church did act in that way at that time. They were together, and they shared with one another. They helped one another. They weren't so concerned with just their own stuff, <laughs> like we tend to be today, but I'm willing to share my stuff because I love you and I care about you. And so that's an important piece to grab a hold of. And the church consistently met together. You notice that. They loved to be together. They consistently uh, met. 
for various types of functions. And I know that is something we are enjoying getting back to, being able to meet together and be with one another. And it's something that we like. And I know many of you have said, when are we going to get to do this? When are we going to get to do that? You know, when will this other thing happen? Because it's a part of our fellowship. Here's another one. The church enjoyed the favor of all the people. Isn't that interesting? I believe that this early church had a good relationship with its community. And it, it, it had favor with the people around them. The people around them were interested in what they were doing, and I believe more were drawn to them because they had this favor. And then the last thing I notice in this section is that the church grew. The church grew. And notice that the Lord brought the increase. It says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And we need to remember that as we faithfully witness for God and we share his love with those around us and we, we hope and pray that people will come around to find Christ, it is the Lord who brings the increase in all of it. And that's what happened here. He brought that increase and the church grew. It says even daily people were added to that number. I've shared with you reports, and you can read a lot of things on different reports from Christian groups and churches, how God has used this time that we've been going through of pandemic and everything else to draw people to himself. And people have been saved during this time. Baptisms have taken place during this time. And it's been amazing how God has worked in a time when it seems like things are supposed to be shut down. Because you can't shut down God, right? You can't shut down his spirit. And we see that here so much. So as we review the happenings of the Pentecost Sunday here from Acts chapter 2, may we be reminded how what God did that day to display his resurrection power, he still does today. He still does today. So don't just look at it as his past experience and let me kind of show how that's working. His power is displayed in the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on us daily to fill us and use us for his glory. It may not be that dramatic event that we read about in Acts 2. You may not feel a great rushing wind. You may not see these tongues of fire, but God is still pouring filling, and using his people. He is still doing that, and we praise God. And whatever we do, we want to do it within the power of his spirit, not our own power. And and his power is displayed in the proclamation of the word of God at our church services, at Bible studies, in our individual witness for the Lord. The Bible is powerful. It's a powerful tool, and God has given it for our, our own growth as well as evangelism as we get the word of God out. To those who have not heard. So his power is still working through his word. I pray each day you get into his word and experience his power. And his power is displayed in the prayer and praise of the church as we gather, as we love one another, and as we love those in our community. May God grant us favor with the people around us as he did to that early church. And I believe the the connections concept that that our welcome team is working on will will help with this. uh, And may the Lord add to our number those who are being saved here at Camp Creek as we are faithful to share his word and his love with those around us. So as we are involved in all of these facets of the Christian life, God's resurrection power shines through. And I trust that we have learned through this series of messages that there is indeed life after Easter. Uh, That celebration does not end when we close up the doors after our Easter Sunday celebration. There is life after Easter, and it is a victorious life. We are able to live victoriously because of what Jesus did when he conquered the grave. It is a powerful life. It's a life filled with that Holy Spirit power. As I do the work God calls me to do, I can't do it in my own strength. I must do it with God, strengthening me. And it is a full life that God gives us. So if you've not received that life that comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ, I encourage you to consider it today, to realize today that, that, that we are all sinners. We've sinned and done things wrong. And because of that sin, we are separated from God in his holiness and his righteousness. But he loves us so much that he has a solution to that problem, and that solution is Jesus.
who came down and died on that cross for you and me and then rose again in victory, and he gives that life to us if we will but receive it. So I encourage you today with that message. Uh, if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, whether you're here with us this morning, if you're viewing online today, please consider Jesus Christ and what he's done to, for you and consider committing yourself to him in salvation today. Will you join me as we pray and uh, conclude our time together? Father, we thank you so much for the power that was displayed on that Pentecost Sunday so long ago. But Lord, we also thank you that you didn't just limit your power to that time and place only. Father, you continue to pour out the power of your Spirit every day upon those who follow you. And so Lord, we, we pray this morning that we would definitely want to be in touch with that power that you have for our lives every day. And that, Lord, we would realize that we can't do anything apart from you working in and through us. And, Father, today as well, if there's any that need to come to you for the first time, that even in this moment they might say yes to you and realize that you are the one that will bring them life over death, victory over the grave, and heaven rather than hell. So, Lord, we want to choose those things with you today. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you for Pentecost. We thank you for the power that has come and the power that will continue to work through us today as we go forth. And we ask this all now in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please stand with me. I want to share a, just a real quick benediction with you as you go. And uh, I look forward to visiting with you and uh, have a great afternoon as well and a wonderful week ahead. Please receive this as you go forth today. Go forth in the power of the resurrection to live for and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in all you do and say. God bless you. Have a great week.